Hi everybody and welcome to WASD20. My name is Nate and today we're going to be taking a look at the board game Dungeon from Wizards of the Coast. So first off I want to thank my patrons for choosing this one out of a lineup of options. Patrons do get input here and there on what products I review and it's also a great way you can just support the channel. So I'll leave a link right up there and you can check that out if you're interested in becoming a patron. Now an interesting thing about Dungeon is that its history is pretty intimately linked to the history of Dungeons and Dragons. It was originally published by TSR, the maker of Dungeons and Dragons, and David Igeri was a good friend of Gary Gygax and showed him his prototype of the game Dungeon that was inspired by early versions of Dungeons and Dragons. The release of Dungeon is right around the same time as Dungeons and Dragons, and it's basically a board game version of some of the things that you do in Dungeons and Dragons, mainly killing monsters and getting treasure. And while the rules have evolved since its original release in 1975, as has the look of the game, the core premise has really stuck true to that principle of killing monsters and getting treasure. So the game is published by Wizards of the Coast, who's also the maker of Dungeons and Dragons right now, and it is for one to eight players, it is for ages eight plus, the game usually retails for around $20, $25. I think on Amazon right now it is $17. You can check out a link in the description below. And without further ado, we're going to head up to my dining room where we usually play our games, and I'm going to spread this thing out, and we'll take a look at the game itself. So we open it up here. The box is very sturdy, uh, pretty good size, and overall it's, it's a nice box, nice-looking cover. Um, if we open it up here, we can see that the board is uh, separated into four sections. The back of the box has a little overview and kind of the pitch if you're at the store. This is what they're doing to try to get you to buy it. It's got an instruction booklet here that has the basics of how to play the game in about 10 pages or so, front and back. The instructions are nice and clear and bright colorful illustrations. Gotta love some of this art here. Look at that gelatinous cube. Um, a drider, uh, yeah, just really cool art. There is also this lovely ad for Creo Dungeons and Dragons, Master the Battle! And some other D&D &D and D&D-like &D projects. Did you know that they have Dungeons and Dragons Clue? I did not know that. Also in the box, there were just a bunch of cards that I have since separated into separate little baggies here because it just seems to be the only good way to store them. Uh, but they were originally a lot of these in sheets that you had to punch out. And there was also this kind of cardboard space filler, which I don't need anymore, so I usually turn in there because uh, it's hard actually to stack these cards when you still have that space filler in there. At this time, I'm going to set up the game and the cards as if I were about to play it, and then we'll take a look. All right, I've got the game pretty much all set up as we would have it if we were playing here. And along one side, I've got the monsters levels one through six. On the other side, I've got the treasure levels one through six. I've got all the cardboard standees here just to give you a look at these. Uh, these are the little character tokens that you use in the game. They have fighter, rogue, cleric, and wizard, one of each gender and several different races. And uh, one of the things I really love about this game actually is that they have a lot of the stuff you need to reference during the game right here at the bottom of the board. So you can see the different characteristics of the uh, different classes, uh, the sequence of play, and what happens when monsters roll against you, and the dungeon key there. So lots of handy tools right on the board, which is nice. And now let's explain a little bit how the game works here. First off, if we have our player here, we have a rogue. Uh, the level one rooms are going to be closest. We are in the Great Hall. And basically, you're going to be making your way to different rooms. In every room, there is either a trap or a monster. And if you fight that monster, you get treasure. If I fight a level three monster in a level three room and I win, then I get to pick a level three treasure card. The treasure cards are all worth different amounts. They are randomized. You shuffle them before the game. Some of them have special abilities. Some of them are just loot that's worth a certain amount of gold. Obviously the higher ones are going to be worth more, so you're more likely to get really good loot if you're going to the higher level rooms. But there is obviously more of a risk if you're going to the higher level rooms because the monsters are going to be much stronger there. 
Certain classes are more inclined to fighting in higher levels. For example, a wizard, because it has spells. These are the spell cards. You can roll to see how many spells you get. There is lightning bolt, fireball, and teleport. Those are the three spells. And uh, you can get something like 10 spells or 12. I think the maximum is 12 spells, depending on how you roll. This is why a wizard, in order to win the game, actually has to get 30,000 gold worth of treasure. A fighter has to get 20,000, and a rogue and cleric have to get 10,000. After you've gone around and collected the amount of treasure indicated, then you have to make it back to the Great Hall. Just to give you a look at some of the monsters here, so here's a bit of a random selection I just pulled out of the deck, and you can see that the um, target number is listed there in order from green to yellow. We would have Rogue, Cleric, Fighter, Wizard, Fireball Spell, and Lightning Spell. And so the Wizard has three options they can choose from, and different monsters have different vulnerabilities, and you have to roll two six-sided dice, and you have to get that target number there in order to beat the monster. Overall, there's a really good selection of monsters and enemies. There's kobolds, orcs, gelatinous cubes, trolls, several kinds of dragons, just a lot of really cool monsters from D&D. Your character can die, especially when you get into some of those higher level monsters. If uh, you miss and you do not kill the monster, then they get to take a swing at you as well. They can miss, they can stun you, they can hurt you, they can seriously hurt you, and they can crush you. Crushed is the most serious, obviously, and that means you need to basically pick a new character and start all over. Leave your treasure in that room. That's another really fun element of this game is that if your character loses treasure or is defeated by a monster, even if they're not completely crushed, uh, you can drop treasure in a room and another player could come by and get that. They do have a handy system for marking the treasure here. If, for example, I am seriously hurt i drop half of my treasure cards in this room and i have to go all the way back to the great hall in that case i would put a number in there and i would put all of my treasure and the monster that was in that room right here under the one and i would place the cards there then another player could come by and scoop that stuff up if they're able to defeat the monster so that's a pretty cool aspect of the game uh, in general, you're going to be going, trying to go to the rooms. If you go to the actual chambers here, there are going to be three monsters and you don't get any treasure. But sometimes you have to go to the chambers in order to find more rooms. All the treasure is in the actual colored rooms here. So that's another interesting aspect of play. The game comes with two six-sided dice, but the dice aren't actually used for movement in the game. You can just move five squares per turn, and that takes a little bit, get, bit of getting used to. The first instinct is always to roll the dice for movement, but you actually just use those for fighting monsters. So on a monster card here, for example, let's take a look at this hill giant. You can see that a rogue has to roll a 10 in order to defeat a hill giant. So I would roll. I got snake eyes, double one. Now the monster gets to take a swing at me, and he got an eight, so I would be hurt. I would drop one random treasure card and retreat one space. I would also lose one turn. So I would retreat one space. I would be given one of these handy turn-lose tokens here to be handed in on my next turn to represent that I lost that turn, and play would continue. I think the only thing I haven't shown you yet is these little graveyard tokens, which are, there's just a ton of them. And those are for when you kill a monster to indicate that that room has been cleared. No one can go in there and get more treasure or defeat any more monsters. Another aspect of the game we didn't talk about is the secret passages here. So in order to find a secret door, you can obviously see them on the board, but in order for your player to move through that secret door, uh, they would need to roll. And the roll for a rogue is going to be much easier, three to six. For every other character, they're going to have to roll a 5 or a 6. There are certain pieces of loot that make certain things like that easier. Here's a secret door card. You can move through all secret doors if you get this card. Uh, another ring. There are some weapons as well, and I'm not seeing any in here. But you can get like a, uh, a magic sword, and in that case you would have to roll to see if it is going to be a plus 1 sword or a plus 2 sword, which is the best you can get. All right, that's enough on the rules for now. I think, uh, while I haven't covered every intricacy of the game, I think I've given you enough to give you a feel for how the game works. 
All right, so now that we've seen how the game works, I'm going to share my impressions of it and my thoughts. The game overall is a staple of the WASD20 household. It is a great game. Me and my kids really enjoy playing it. I will say that if it were not for my kids, I don't know if I would play this game very often at all. For a group of adults to get together and play it, I can see some groups of adults having fun, but not the people that I hang out with in general. Uh, most of them would either rather play a tabletop role-playing game when we get together because we get together so rarely to do it, or they're just not into this sort of thing. The, the idea of playing a fantasy board game where you're going into a dungeon and killing monsters and getting treasure just is not that appealing for my wife, for example. However, I can see that it has a really competitive feel to it. Who's going to get the treasure and get out? And, you know, someone dies and you can swoop in and you can take their treasure if you can beat the monster in the room and all this. It does have a very kind of competitive feel that I could see adults having fun with and it being a nice break from a regular tabletop RPG game night. I'll also say that the notion that this is Dungeons & Dragons for kids, I think that's a mistake. I think kids are capable of hand handling real tabletop role-playing games. My kids can. We play Hero Kids RPG, we'll play No Thank You Evil, we'll even play kind of a stripped down version of Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder sometimes, and we have a lot of fun with it. But for me, that does require some level of prep, and being the dungeon master and all this can require a level of attention and patience for me with young kids that sometimes is just easier to pull out a board game and just play something. It's very casual, it's easy just to pull out of the box and go. So we really enjoy it for that. My eight-year-old right now has been playing it since he was six, and he's been totally capable of understanding it and doing well. Uh, my five-year-old, not so much. He's, you know, his attention wanes a little bit, but he does play it with us sometimes. Usually ends up leaving before the game is over. In terms of the uh, overall build quality of the game, it's really excellent. The, everything is very well produced. Uh, the, the tokens and the cards feel good. The board itself is high quality. And the art is really nicely done. The art has sort of a cartoony feel in its current iteration. Some of the older versions of the game were less so, uh, but I really like it. It makes it a little more kid-friendly, and the art is just really nice to look at. It's got a good style. So overall, while I wouldn't say it's a perfect game, and it's not like the most fun game I've ever played, it is really fun, and I do recommend you check it out. I think it is worth the price if this is something that sounds interesting to you. If you own the game, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. And if you have any questions for me, leave those down in the comments below. I would really appreciate it. Thanks for watching this one, everybody. If you enjoyed it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed. And everybody take care. You'll see me again very soon.